Good morning. We're ready for day two. Are we ready? Well, we're thrilled to begin day two of the uh, 2024 Health Equity Conference. And welcome back. You all look bright and chipper this morning. Uh, so we had a packed day one. And just now we were able to share with you the experiences of a few people who are our real focus of this conference. People using the Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and Marketplace programs. The video that preceded me showed a bit more from people that we met yesterday in, in our video and two additional people. Andres, who has a marketplace coverage, he spoke in Spanish about the importance of understanding what is available. And Aminia, who, has, who is covered by Medicaid, spoke of the trust and how important it is to trust your provider. And Eugene, with, who's on Medicare, said, and Angela, who has Medicaid, spoke of the longevity and the quality and how important it is to have affordable and accessible health care. They all offered a glimpse of what's in store for you today. In the video, Andrew spoke about the value of information, which reminded me of our office's coverage to care health insurance program, Literacy Initiative. And we have resources about how to understand health coverage and how to use it. Of course, I've got to pitch our resource table, which is downstairs. And there are a few other resource tables down there, but I want you to see coverage, of care, coverage to care particularly. Um, and it's, it helps people connect to primary and preventive care. And you'll find a lot of other information on our technical assistance program at our exhibit booth. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you haven't yet had a chance to visit our federal partners uh, exhibit booths and the poster exhibits, <clears throat> they're both open again today. So please make sure you stop by. And for those of you who can't decide which breakout session to attend or are looking for materials, please note that all of the slides, because we've had this question, transcripts, and recordings, guess where they're going to be after the conference? On our website. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> so yesterday we heard it, uh, in the maternal health session about the importance of awareness of trauma and how important community efforts are needed to move forward. And we heard about healthcare systems and communities collaborating to meet the breadth of the community needs. And we reaffirm the need of health equity data, collection, reporting, standardization, and analysis. Today, we will keep hearing about health equity in action. We're excited to hear from leaderships across our CMS programs and, that we, and all the things that we are doing to advance health equity as it relates to health care coverage, access, affordability, and quality. In the breakout sessions, we'll, have, we'll hear directly from people who are in the field about using our, our, about the running of our CMS models, our waiver programs, and how we're using these to advance equity in their communities by meeting their needs, not, not without going through one size fits all. We'll hear about oral health, artificial intelligence, and, um, and a, a sondry of other tools. I know that sounds like a lot, but there's more. I've really been looking forward to what I'm about to share with you today. This announcement today, we are very excited. It's going to happen very shortly in the next portion of this conference, since we're able to reintroduce the CMS Health Equity Award. Our office has awarded this a few times in the past, and we're thrilled, thrilled to be able to recognize the hard work happening across the healthcare systems to advance health equity. As you've heard many times yesterday and today, we're focused this year on sustainability and actionability. And those are the ideas that we want to keep in mind when we awarded this Health Equity Award. We received over 80 nominations. And let me tell you, it was not, a, it was not easy to select simply two. We heard from people doing mobile clinics, research, interventions on blood pressure, vaccines, language support, outreach, research, and even, diver and even diversifying the workforce. There's more than I could name, but the, all of these candidates were worthy of, their, of our attention. We heard from health providers, insurers, payers, large groups, community groups, uh, giants in the industry, and people who were really small part of their community, but were doing big things. Our team was honored to learn of the amazing work going on across the healthcare system. To have the honor of telling us more in presenting this award, I'm now happy to introduce one of our fearless leaders, and that is our principal, principal deputy administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, 
John Blum. John Blum currently serves as the Principal Deputy Administrator and the Chief Operating Officer at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. In this dual role, John, who has no free time, over <laughs> <clears throat> oversees CMS programs, policy, and planning, along with the implementation of our day-to-day -day operations for the entire agency. I must add that John is a dedicated public service. This is his second time in serving in a senior leadership position at CMS. He previously served as the deputy administrator and the director for the Center of Medicare from 2009 to 2014, leading the agency's Medicare payment and delivery reform strategies and the policy programs for management of the Medicare program. His complete bio, if you want to hear more, is on our website. But without further ado, let me introduce Mr. John Blow. Yes. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to first and foremost thank the CMS team for putting on a uh, really phenomenal conference. I heard that yesterday was was uh, uh, fantastic and just can't thank folks enough for coming out for day two. I just want to just maybe say just a few comments before um, we're giving out these awards. Uh, uh, but for CMS, um, that our work really is around uh, setting policy, setting payments, uh, signing contracts, uh, creating data standards. And so we trust and so we hope that those that carry out services really fulfill the goals that we have to close gaps in care, to close disparities, to really focus on um, those that are underheard, those that are underserved. And today we want to honor two organizations that have that have carried out that work, that have carried out that mission, and have really um, set the pace, set the standards, set the tone for how we want the healthcare system to work throughout our country. And I first want to commend Latino, Latino Connection for doing phenomenal work throughout the state of uh, 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 Pennsylvania. Uh, here are some numbers. They delivered 9,000 COVID tests. They, they delivered 17,000 vaccinations, provided 500 flu shots throughout the community, and 10,000 PPE, uh, uh, PPE kits. Think about what happened during the pandemic. Think about those um, that suffered the most. Latino Connection did phenomenal work to serve, to ensure that those that were um, that were most affected by the pandemic kept the tests, the vaccinations, and the resources they needed, and just set a, a phenomenal foundation. So please, up from Latino Connection, join me on stage. <laughs> Uh, during the past three years, uh, during my second time here at CMS, that I've had the chance to uh, travel to probably 25 different states to see healthcare that's that's uh, been been just challenged, and no more uh, 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 throughout the country is uh, the care systems uh, uh, throughout rural America um, having uh, a tremendous challenge on primary care access. Uh, 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 access to hospital care. Can I, Augusta Health uh, uh, really close that mission? Uh, 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 really serve that mission? Uh, uh, here are some uh, to real key numbers: uh, fourteen unique uh, 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 unique sites of care delivered through mobile clinics, serving seventeen thousand forty patients, eight hundred and twenty five unique patients. Uh, they set up services in uh, local communities, local organizations, just to serve the people where they are. And uh, for, for, uh, uh, for Augusta Health, uh, uh, please join the stage. Thank you. 
Again, thank you for joining us today. We can't thank you enough to our two organizations. Um, they are leading the country. They are leading the example for us. We can't thank you enough for all of your work. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the technical support. <laughs> well, good morning. So we are going to take a few minutes to uh, have a discussion with our awardees here. So John and I have a few questions for you, but we'll make sure it's not too painful. Want to go first, John? I'm just curious, um, how do you decide what services to provide? How do you decide what are the, um, the, key, the key areas for focus for your two organizations? Go first. Okay. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm Mark LaRosa, Chief of Staff at Augusta Health. And thank you very much, first of all, for the award. You know, it is an honor. Uh, for us to be in this situation when I heard from Pamela that there was 80 other applications. That's just amazing. The amazing part of that is all the work that's being done in our communities uh, collectively when you add that up. And so we're honored to be part of those caregivers that are in the community. Um, Augusta Health is a 255-bed hospital located in uh, central western part of Virginia. We're only two and a half hours from here. Uh, right in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, we serve about 300,000 people. We have 260 providers uh, that are part of our organization. Um, and um, to answer your question specifically, how did we begin to select the services? Uh, how much time do I have? Is this the brief part of the questions or the long part? Uh, because it's an interesting story. Um, we actually, our journey began with the pandemic in 2000, in 2020 when the pandemic hit. Uh, we had just finished our strategic plan uh, in 2019 that said we want to be a uh, national model for community-based health care. And what that meant is we were going to really lean into health equity. And then guess what happened? The pandemic. And that gave us, okay, here you go. Now's your opportunity. Full-blown. And um, we partnered with the Department of Health in our area to deliver COVID-19 vaccinations and uh, delivered a number of vaccinations uh, in a number of locations. And that was the key to what began our journey into the mobile clinics. Um, we went out and we found locations to deliver these, these vaccinations with our team. And we partnered with leaders in the community where to do this in churches and it was those, those were the seeds that began to determine what we, services we would provide and where we would provide them. We came back and we looked at the community and we said, how can we scientifically make sure that we've got the right locations? And so we took the University of Wisconsin Deprivation Index, which organizes census tracts by uh, socioeconomic indicators and then we overlaid that with our own ED data, looking for patients that had not seen a primary care physician in three years. And we mapped them all out over the area. And lo and behold, there was an overlap in the deprivation index and the uh, primary care, uh, lack of primary care services. And so that's really the story, how we got to determine how we were going to provide primary care services we reached out to those partners that we had developed from COVID-19 and built upon uh, those relationships. And so I'm sure that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but it was an, it was an interesting story. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. Tiana Connection. 
Buenos dias. Uh, I, my name is George Fernandez. I'm the founder and CEO of Latino Connection. Um, I get to uh, represent a phenomenal team of 40 plus healthcare warriors. Uh, we are a social determinants of health marketing and communications outreach agency. And we basically partner with community, business, healthcare, education, and government entities. And we help them understand effective ways and, st and strategies to reach hard to reach communities, predominantly African American, Latino, and LGBTQA. Um, I'm a product of a single mother of three, survivor of domestic violence, uh, immigrated from Dominican Republic. And um, I've taken my mother's challenges and have made them the backbone and the purpose of why I started this agency in 2015. I left behind a phenomenal corporate gig um, in the area of um, studying healthcare consumerism and behaviors in the areas of marketing uh, to focus full time on, on Latino connection. And for us, it's really about helping to build stories and to connect people to resources that can help shift their mindset uh, to create healthier behaviors and to um, shift the way that they are behaving to, ins to empower them to live healthier, more active, engaged lifestyles. Um, during the, um, during the uh, pandemic, our, our office is closed and um, our team really had to make a decision of whether we would sit on the bench and the sidelines and wait for things to reopen or did we want to pivot and really get out there and help connect those communities that really needed these services. Remember when COVID-19 testing started happening, like it, it was it was being done through a stick. It had to be a drive up. There was no walk up testing when it all first started. And um, there was one person in Pennsylvania um, that I picked up the phone and um, I cannot believe this person believed in my crazy vision uh, to use a mobile unit that would drive into low income, hard to reach communities and, and, and essentially meet them where they are. That is truly aligning with social determinants of health. Um, Dr. Levine, at that time, Secretary of Health for the Pennsylvania Department of Health, now Admiral Levine for Health and Human Services, um, believed in our vision um, right when the New York Times reported that African Americans and Hispanics were dying at higher disproportionate rates than any other ethnic demographic group. So um, be careful what you wish for, little George. Um, Dr. Levine believed in us. Admiral Levine believed in us. And uh, she, she in, in the Pennsylvania Department of Health at that time, also with the governor of Pennsylvania, decided to fund uh, Pennsylvania's first ever COVID-19 mobile response unit. Um, while I get to stand on this beautiful stage and, and, and lights and cameras with all of you and take credit for that work, it was really my team that really went out there and woke up really early, drove thousands of miles from urban to uh, rural communities and met with over... 200 plus provider partners um, like the Augusta Health, you know, type of FQHCs and, 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 and healthcare centers that really met us in those communities and ultimately helped connect people to care. Uh, we were literally saving people's lives and we were sharing facts to ultimately erase fear. Um, and I'm very proud that I get to work for an amazing team like some of the team members that have joined me here today. So thank you all so much. And thank you to CMS for the recognition. I'm humbled to be amongst a pool of 80 plus organizations that, uh, that, that, that were submitted for this. And um, to anyone and everyone doing SDOH work, my hat goes off to you. Um, because this type of work is not easy work. And if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Uh, right. And um, it, we don't do it for the money. We do it for the hard work. Health equity is not easy work, people. That's right. Health equity is not easy work. You have to totally be you have to totally be invested. Um, it's it's hard to reach African-American communities. It's hard to reach my gay community. I'm gay myself. I know they're out there. Um, you know, Latinos are also really hard to reach communities. And, you know, it, it, it really was delivered in one of the video remarks uh, from one of the speakers. You have to build trust with these communities. If you're not building trust with these communities, they're going to see you as just another vendor versus an actual partner to their actual healthcare journey. So, again, thank you to CMS for having us. And we're just thrilled to be here today. Thank you. It, that kind of that kind of leads into our one of my next questions for for both of you would be what were some of the most challenging barriers and how did you overcome them because we're honoring you because you you really were able to be successful but what were some of the challenges that you faced early on? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for uh, asking that. My name is Isaac Azillo. I'm the director of 
public and primary care services for our medical group at Augusta Health, and I, I help lead the uh, mobile clinic team that goes into neighborhoods. And, and I wish we had a, a nice vehicle to be able to go uh, into neighborhoods with, but Our we line. actually go in to brick and mortar locations such as churches, homeless shelters, uh, community centers to help deliver care. And we actually take primary care like you would see in an office and we develop that in, in our clinics. And so we go by a, a rule of the three L's. We, we wanna learn, we want to listen, okay, and then we have our community partners lead. And so if I break those down and we talk about learning is that we have to humble ourselves and we have to go to our community partners and, and understand what they're facing each day, right? And so what you don't know, you don't know. And we, once it was reemphasized that yesterday, and so we we sit down, we have conversations, we understand what the barriers to healthcare are for our community. And once we really understand that, then we can develop unique services that are specific to each one of those communities. And so I want to also emphasize the importance of partnering with community partners and really being selective in regards to uh, making sure that they're completely engaged that they're passionate as you are about health equity work. It's, it is very challenging and hard work, but very rewarding work. And so they have a shared mission and vision that you do to help deliver that care. And when you have that, that is something so powerful, right? And so we, we, we learn and then we listen, right? We listen in to the challenges, whether it's transportation. And so we're taking that challenge from them by going to their locations uh, within the communities. Uh, we, we think about, is it uh, finances? So the care that we deliver in our, our mobile primary care clinic is, is for people that are uninsured, underinsured, uh, and there is no cost out of pocket for all the services that we provide there, which is exceptional. And they keep coming back. And then we let our community partners lead. Right. We want we're, we're there. We're educated in trauma informed care. We've built these trusting relationships. Patients believe in us and, and keep coming back. They might not always listen to the care that we prescribe, but they keep coming back. And that is because the leadership of those community partners. And for example, we have pastors from African-American churches that go and they speak. We have Latino leaders within the community that go to the communities and the Latinx population and, and help connect. Uh, we have our community outreach team that go, have been going to homeless shelters all through the pandemic that have uh, been delivering vaccinations, testing, screen, health screenings, foot care, and such to these vulnerable populations. And because those trusted leaders in the community have already built that trust, uh, we're able to be very effective in delivering chronic disease management and delivering care in a way that's unique to like the homeless population. They use the emergency room for their care, correct? And we want to get ahead of that preventative medicine, help them understanding what vaccinations and the importance they are in their life. Health screenings, right? Never have had a colonoscopy or mammography in their life. So we're able to do all those things by, by really incorporating the three L's. Please. I'll share. Um, I believe in the power of storytelling. So when when um, Admiral Levine uh, awarded this major grant to our organization to to launch this program, um, we thought we were going to have a good you know two or three months to get ready. Right, girl, that was not the case. Okay, <laughs> they looked at us and said, "You need to hit the road in less than two weeks, as people are dying," and that literally was the case. Right. Um, I, I, I need us to understand that we continue to use the term health equity today like it's a new term. It ain't no new term, y'all. It's not a new term. Latinos and blacks have been leading number one in charts that we don't want to be number one in for years. For years! I'm talking about lack to, to affordable housing, access to healthy food, Okay, HIV and STIs, 
obesity, diabetes, hypertension, you name it. It is my black and brown Hispanic folks that are number one in those charts. Like Jennifer Lopez was at the, you know, to TV and, 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 and music. That's not a chart we want to be number one in. Okay. But let me tell you what the problem is. The problem, the challenge is that in the world that we're living in today, this community is constantly invited late to the dance party. So when we don't have a seat at the table, we got to bring our own. And when you invite me late to a dance party, I don't get to wear my best dress. Okay. So for us, our challenge is, is always timing to answer your question. It's just timing. The timing never really aligns with having the resources, with being able to reach people effectively, use the data to actually make better decisions in how we're planning to reach these folks. And it is black and brown communities that continue to have more babies than any other ethnic minority group. 3.4 adults per Hispanic household when a Caucasian household is 1.7 adults. Okay, so th th that, that, that is astounding. The numbers of adults in a Hispanic or black household are much larger than any of our white brothers and sisters. So for us, overcoming those challenges is so important. So let me get to the actual answer to the question here really quick. Because um, I, I wanted to set the tone of the setting. Um, how to overcome those challenges is really by listening, okay? And, and Augusta Health already said it. During, during um, November, we all are donating turkeys left and right. But we don't even know if the communities where we're donating these turkeys even eat turkey. Do they even have a working oven? Do they even know how to cook a turkey, right? So it is so important that we together begin to co-create solutions that work for the communities that we are reaching. And we were able to do that. Our little firm, our little agency was able to do that because we took the time during the pandemic to actually listen. And we started to reach out to local churches and schools and daycares and community-based organizations. And we asked them, outside of COVID-19 testing and then ultimately became vaccines, what do y'all need? And because we were able to then leverage our corporate partners like the Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shields and the CBS Healths and the Aetnas of the world, we were able to then leverage and find monies and resources elsewhere to fulfill the needs because you know there's never enough money. And we tend to put all the responsibility on government. That's the other problem. We can't continue to depend on the government to solve all of our problems, okay? We need to be better consumers and begin to co-create solutions that can empower our communities to live healthier, more active, engaged lives. I'm totally going to let you know they're not going to invite me again. Um, just to, just to build on that up, theme. Maybe oh, we can. Sorry. But just to build up on that theme, what's the one recommendation, the one solution that you would offer the federal government, state governments, local governments, uh, what you want to see to better support your work? Uh, for me, I think that it's extremely important. First of all, you are, are you're already doing some of this work. You're already hiring people in, in, in power making decision roles that look like the communities that we are serving. That's where it starts. OK. And over the next few years, we're going to have a major exodus of a lot of providers that are going to be retiring. OK. And I think it's extremely important that we begin to build the pipeline of talent. OK. For black, Hispanic, gay, Asian, minority, period, across all sectors in healthcare, And I believe that there needs to be more dollars and resources made available in the areas of workforce development, language line access, um, and ultimately um, begin to look at the data that minorities are becoming the new American reality and that it is extremely important to begin walking that talk. And while some of these programs already exist and are out there, there needs to be more money and more time and, um, you know, kind of kind of bring it to the front burner of the kitchen stove, per se, and make it a priority for the administration. Did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind responding to that. I think that's a great point. And, you know, what's been a blessing for us is that developing the mobile clinic has actually become a recruiting tool for, for providers. I... I continuously have providers want to come and be part of this progr program uh, to help with resiliency over the last few years in, in care. Um, 
we really need, I feel we talking about support is, is more boots on the ground. So more community health workers. Um, there's yes. Thank you. I think you'd have some in the audience. really need to have people be able to help, uh, uh, map out individuals and handhold them through the steps of care. And and that's what they need. The real vulnerable populations, that's what they need. We need uh, sustainability and funding. I think that would be very supportive in terms of these uh, rural uh, communities. Transportation is huge. Uh, developing a real standardization and in, in helping transportation through the handholding. Uh, more maternal health navigators that that can help individuals in, in rural settings. I know that's we, we have one. We're so fortunate. Our organization supports this. She goes to jails, uh, actually, as well. So uh, within the community, she's remarkable. Um, so there's a lot of things. Mark, you have anything else to include in that, in that, that laundry list of things? I think between the two of you, you've covered it. Uh, food insecurity <laughs> is also an area that we're wrestling with, too. And uh, what we, uh, interestingly, Augusta Health is located in an, a very agricultural area. So we have a farm on our campus and we uh, raise crops and put those crops back into the community to uh, promote nutrition. Uh, and a lot of these communities, uh, 80% of it goes back into those communities free of charge and, and through various different ways. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Crystal Moyers is in charge of the farm and also our community partnership. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge them. Well, I can't help but um, but say to you, when you were putting together these these applications and deciding, what was probably the motivator for you to say this this is something that should be recognized? What did you know was special about your work at that point? For us at Latino Connection, we want to empower others um, to be courageous and to not live with the what if, could have, should have. Um, I, I could have chosen to stay on the sidelines and not have called um, Dr. Levine to propose uh, using our mobile unit as a COVID-19 resource. Um, and I think it's um, really important that there's a lot of small organizations out there that just really need uh, someone else to believe in them uh, the same way that Dr. Levine believed in us. Um, and before the pandemic, we were at three mobile units and today we have a fleet of 23 vehicles. Um, so yeah, well, again, while I get to take credit for that, I'm surrounded by a very large group of healthcare warriors, mostly women because they get, they get shit done. Um, yes, mostly women on my team, gotta say, um, and uh, also, don't be don't be the smartest person in the room. Always surround yourself with smart people. Yeah. Um, as as the CEO of this organization, they don't work for me. I work for them. Um, and you know, I think for us, it's also about when we when we were putting this application together, we want to let other organizations that are either minority or Latino organizations know. That today, an organization like us, as little as we are from little Hershey, Harrisburg, sweetest place on earth, Pennsylvania, is being recognized by a federal agency, CMS, at a federal level today. So th we're, we're just really humbled that, that we're here with you today. So thank you again. Thank you. Did you? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, I really believe it's uh, to be recognized. I'm sorry. So I, I just need to point out that um, not with us today, today is Dr. Clint Merritt who is really the brains behind the operation. And he had the vision for the, for the mobile clinics. And it's taken five of us to replace him uh, 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 to come here. I said, Clint, who's going to do this? And he said, well, it's going to take five of you to... Uh, uh, no, uh, but actually, he's very appreciative. Also, Mary Mannix, our, our chief executive officer, who was also very much behind this. And so as we stumble across each other here trying to figure out who's going to take which question, that's why, because we're covering some big shoes. Yeah, he, I remember conversations with Dr. Mary. He and I were hand in hand through the pandemic uh, and this kind of formulating and creating some ideas. But the reason that I, I feel that the recognition was important is the, is the teams that are, are doing this work. The, the from the administrative assistants to the community health workers, the social workers, case managers, nurses, providers. This is an easy work. 
and we go to some very vulnerable places um, in different communities that's vulnerable for us, you know, from an understanding standpoint or just a, a unsafe standpoint. And the outcomes that they are creating is phenomenal. We've had a 22% reduction in ER visits from our patients, over a 40% reduction in urgent care visits, and a 66% reduction in hospitalizations from our patients. Uh, and that's due to the team. That has nothing to do with me. I'm not the smartest man in the room, agree? But I have really smart, passionate people. And this is why we go into medicine, right? I'm a nurse by training, and this is why we go into medicine. And to be able to deliver the care, I got cold chills right now. Uh, <laughs> as we're able to deliver that medicine, that's what it's about. Right. So understanding the passion, seeing patients get homes, go to work, right, have their diabetes managed and controlled to help treat STIs that are very easily be treatable if they just needed to be detected. Those are the reasons that we do the work. Yeah, you know, I just might add one other thing to all that, that great response. Um, one of the things that we found as an indicator to let us know that uh, this was something that we wanted to uh, uh, submit in the application was the responses that we had from our partners. When we started to go out there, we found that there were others in the community who wanted to be a part of it. The food pantry wanted to be there. The Valley Community Services Board, which brings mental health services, wanted to be there at the same time. And so when you start to see this momentum building, you start to think, maybe there's something right about this. And then you add the numbers on top of it that we've talked about and you've got the science behind it. Um, but really was the momentum that's building in the community and that which makes us so excited about where we can go from here. Thank you. That's a great point. Be selective, guys. Be very selective in when you select your locations. I think be very, be very bright. So we go to a church called Central United Methodist Church, and they have a food pantry there from 9 to 1. Guess what time our mobile clinic goes? And, and guess what's right across the street? Free lunch at Trinity Episcopal Church every afternoon. So guess where we put our information? And we work with their faith-based nurses in there. So be very strategic in where you go because that will deem effective. Thank you. So here's the last question. Where do you want to be in five years? Looking out five years, where do you want your organizations to be? Um, so do you mind if I go first? Okay. <laughs> I got to get it in. These two are like... <laughs> and this is a great conversation. This is nothing we can new, by the way. On. How much more time do we have? Um, so first thing is we actually are trying to raise money for a mobile van. And so we want to have that mobile van up and operating in, in five years. Uh, it'll partner with some of those neighborhood clinics, but we also want to be able to take it to places that are hard to get to uh, in a lot of those communities that you've mentioned. Um, the other thing that we want to do in the next five years is really lean into the outcomes. Uh, we've, it's been so exciting because we've only been at this for a little over 18 months, maybe almost two years now. And we're just starting to see some of these exciting indicators that Isaac mentioned. And now we're really leaning into uh, chronic diseases. And we're tracking all of those patients. And we're, we're diligently doing that so that we can show the outcomes from the model moving forward. So that's part of our five-year vision. We want to continue to develop more partners and leverage those partners across all of those locations. And, and the one thing that I'll say, what this has done for the organization is when you think about healthcare going forward, we've all got to think differently about how we deliver care innovatively and really reaching out to the community. We say healthcare starts in the community and ends in the community. And what this has taught us is we can do it. We can, rather than having a, a mentality of, we're not big enough to do that, we don't have the money to do this, we're learning, well, what if, what if we could? And it's really starting to change our culture, and that's part of our five-year vision where we want to go. Just, uh, thank you, George. You know, I have something to say. <laughs> um, I would like to expand the services that we provide. So we have partnerships with uh, a mental health group, but I would love to have my own mental health workers to help out. I would love to have my own community health workers. I would love to have uh, some more specific 
chronic disease management specialist. Um, I would love to have pharmacists that could go on with this. I know pharmacy is a huge, huge uh, struggle with some of these populations. So, and, and having a funding source for people that can't afford that to manage their chronic diseases. So, some more of the specialized things uh, in, in our mobile units uh, to go to these locations. I'm done now. Thank you, George. <laughs> I think for, uh, for Latino Connection and, and, and Color and Culture, which is a part of our, of our um, family of brands, um, our, our next five-year strategy is really looking at data um, and really becoming more human-centered, um, really understanding people's needs before creating a solution for them, inviting them early to the table to co-create those solutions on their behalf. And the way that we're doing that is we're having really uncomfortable conversations with our local, um, regional, statewide, and even federal government partners. I think it's important that contracts and agreements and grants begin to be awarded to the organizations that look like the communities that they are ultimately needing to reach. And I think it really starts there. Yeah, I think it really starts there. Um, there's There's been times when We've seen contracts awarded to an organization that doesn't feel comfortable going into the black and brown communities or doesn't don't feel safe. That's all right. But guess what? Someone else out there does. So for us, our next five years is really building on those partnerships and synergies uh, that can ultimately help communities uh, live healthier. And I can't wait to see. Um, our, our current White House staff get re-elected to keep moving on that agenda, but ultimately really driving the force of that health equity and making sure that that is to the forefront of, this, of the kitchen stove and having the uncomfortable conversations that are going to help our communities progress. Well, I'd like to thank both of you or both of your organizations and all of you for being here today and sharing this experience. And we're honored that we could honor you. You're doing great work and keep up the good fight. Yes. I think we'd move into a break now. I don't have the agenda in front of me, but is that correct, Tina? Posters and networking. That's right. Thank you. So you have a few moments to meet your colleagues and um, all of them will be. Do you have others here with you from your organizations? If so, could they please stand and be acknowledged if you're That's here with great. either of our. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Well, enjoy your, uh, the rest of your afternoon, and we'll see you back here for our afternoon plenary. Thank you, everyone.